Jimmy, for putting it on right now. For remembering. <laughs> yes. So Janet M. Harvey is the best-selling author of the award-winning leadership and coaching book, Invite Change, Lessons from 2020, The Year of No Return. She's also the CEO of Invite Change, a coaching and human development organization that shapes a world where people love their lives work. As a visionary leader in the global professional coaching industry, Janet is an ICF master certified coach and accredited educator who has engaged adults, teams, and global enterprises for 27 years to invite change that sustains well-being and excellence. Janet M. Harvey uses her executive and entrepreneurial experience to cultivate leaders in sustainable excellence through generative wholeness, a signature generative coaching and learning process for people, processes, and systems. Her colleagues, audiences, and clients. Mm. One second, that pop-up chat made my um, intro disappear. <laughs> Her That's me being provocative, Misha. <laughs> Her colleagues, audiences, and clients regard her as a bold, curious, provocative, articulate, and compassionate human being. You have no idea, especially when you get to sit and talk with her. Uh, just a relaxed setting, a, 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 a kindred spirit and a rub wet heart too. <laughs> and good That's luck right. trying to keep up with her. And, <laughs> um, and, and to just introduce her to many of you and just to reintroduce you to, to her also. Some of you who know her already, we welcome Janet M. Harvey to our platform this afternoon, this evening. Thank you, Janet. <laughs> Thank you. Welcome, welcome. And uh, those of you that have been on master classes with me before know that my uh, my strong invitation to you is leave your mics open. I know that there are many protocols around the world where people say, no, no, on Zoom, you should never have your mics open. Um, I'm not interested in breaking the connection. So if you happen to talk over each other, it's okay. <laughs> That's what happens when we're sitting in a living room and enjoying each other's company and having some time to really relax into uh, what we're thinking and how something is influencing or landing for us. So um, please, if you can, uh, obviously I saw Heather, you're driving, keep your eyes on the road. Don't turn your camera on. <laughs> And uh, and it's okay. We'll hear from you when you land somewhere where you're not in motion. Um, but before the rest of you, yep, that's fine, Shakti. And uh, just rush to mute if the dog barks. Although, frankly, I kind of gotten used to the last two years of dogs and kids and <laughs> husband saying, uh, excuse me, I need something. Uh, in some ways, yeah, I think it's given us back our humanity, uh, a little less formality and a little more personal. So... Um, the only other thing at a housekeeping level before we dive into our content for today, I did put the visuals uh, in PDF format. You can bring those down to your desktop. There's another document there which has the core competency skills for one, two, four, and six. And these are our subject of um, attention for today's talk. And um, you'll have a chance to use them. We will do um, a breakout. It won't be a pair coaching. However, uh, I think it will be useful to you to have the reference of the skills themselves. And um, the article, can you just show me by, uh, uh, raise your hand if you wouldn't mind just physically in the image. How many of you did get a chance to read the article in Choice Magazine that Jimmy sent out yesterday? Okay. All right. So, um, can he resend it? Uh, yeah, I think I can put it. I'm trying to yeah, find you it. Yeah, you go right ahead and put it. Why don't you go ahead and put, put it in the, the chat. chat? Yeah, that would be great. Um, the choice column is never very long, so it's probably something you can scan a bit. The particular issue of choice uh, was completely dedicated to um, beyond DEI as belonging. And 
for those of you that um, feel like you're in the world as an ally or you're in the world as a practitioner working in DEIJB work, um, or you're an in, just an interested person wanting to understand these issues more fully, there are some extraordinary writers in this particular issue. So if you go to choice-online.com, you can order just that particular issue, either electronically or in print. And it is volume 19 and number two. Don't ask me. I've been sitting on the editorial board for years. I have no idea where Gary comes up with this numbering scheme. <laughs> but it's choice, volume 19, number two. And it's from inclusion to belonging, why DEI isn't enough. So some very wonderful coaches who are um, working in this space quite deeply, wrote quite passionately. And uh, the article that is the backdrop for what we're going to do today together uh, is the coaching mastery column in that issue. And there you go. It's now in chat for you. So... I have been thinking about this body of work, the fact that we have um, really inequitable access mm -hmm. to coaching education and to coaching both uh, around the world. We've been, um, I sat on chapter boards in three states and then sat on the global board. And every year we had that question, what do we do about fees? What do we do about people that can't afford it? What do we do about indexes of financial and economic viability? These are not easy questions to answer. And of course, um, the impact, no matter what answer we give, um, somebody is unhappy. And I think sometimes we can get lost in the weeds and forget what we're talking about. Um, in my opinion, this is, you know, my bias, I'll put it out on the table, is that anything that ends with ism, any ism, is a form of othering. And sometimes those isms are done because we want to call attention to something that has been dismissed or uh, diminished or excluded in some way. And that's important. It's important that we notice Oh my gosh, I just have this blank space, which by the way, a really wonderful colleague of mine um, said, you know, we really should stop talking about blind spots. <laughs> and like, and the minute she said it, I went, of course, that would be othering blind people. It's not like they can't be in the world in a robust and vital way. They simply have a handicap with one of their senses. But I can tell you, their intuition and their hearing and their sensing is off the charts amazing. Like I'm, I'm always learning from my friends who um, do not have visual acuity. So I've gone to calling it blank spaces instead of blind spots. <laughs> Try it on for size, see what you think. So um, when I started really thinking deeply about isms as othering, I realized that uh, I didn't really know a lot about the either the psychology or the sociology that was behind it. And I discovered a man named John A. Powell. He does spell his name on purpose with all lowercase letters. That might already give you an indication a little bit about who he is. And I will give you his official title. <laughs> he is um, at UC Berkeley. He is the founder of the Othering and Belonging Institute. He also holds the Robert D. Haas, who's the founder of UC Berkeley, the chair in equity and inclusion. He is a professor of law and a professor of African-American studies and ethnic studies at UC Berkeley and a wonderful man. So if you're wanting after this to do a little deeper dive, really easy to find his YouTubes and um, the Othering and Belonging Institute holds lots of free webinars. It's a tremendous resource bank. You can find something for yourself, something for clients, something for the chapter. I would, you know, Misha and Jimmy and the rest of the board, as you're moving your own initiatives forward in this area, um, please lean into that resource. Okay. So let's see here. Nope, that's not what I want. I want this. 
So you notice it says, start with yourself. Uh, and I think in some ways, this is probably the most important first lesson for all of us. Our, um, our platform as coaches is to do good in the world. Uh, we have an ethical obligation to be thinking about the impact of our choices and decisions. And unless we've begun with ourselves, we're likely to overlay our own bias and we will have missed the point of being able to see somebody for who they truly are. So as we go through this today, of course, think about um, your own practice as a coach. And I'd ask you to maybe hold that lightly until we come to the end and let today be more of a personal exploration together. This is the roadmap. Um, how do you, how do you, in your own practices, your own reflection work, how do you discover new ways to access vitality, your vitality, your client's vitality? How do you feel about wholeness? What's the way you translate wholeness to your clients? What does it mean to see someone as whole when they don't see themselves as whole? These are things that often live in the invisible energy field that we co-create with clients. And yet, we're really called in the new competencies and in our ethical code to ask. If we fail to bring forward the question, tell me about your culture. What about your context is being influenced by the culture you're living in? And how does it in some way show up as a limiting belief or an empowering belief or a dishonoring of your value system? How do you identify? Do people know how you identify? These questions for a long time, coaches have said to me, well, but if it's not relevant to the agenda, I can't ask them. It's not accurate. We are coaching in a client-centered way, which means by definition, we must be tenacious and thorough in learning who is this client and who are they becoming? It's not a one-time thing you do during contracting or in an initial discovery session or even in your chemistry sessions. It's something you're doing ongoing. I've had clients reveal things to me two years into working together that they didn't realize. Gosh, I never told you that story, really? And like in that moment, the life lesson of that moment was so profoundly relevant to whatever we were working on that it utterly altered the approach we were using in our coaching for the rest of that session. So the whole person matters and it's our responsibility to learn how to use these skills in a more artful way, not as a checklist, but as a passionate, deep, unconditional curiosity to learn who our client is. And of course, some peer practice today. And how do you begin to think about equity? I prefer the term equity to equality. I know we've had hours and hours and hours of debate about all of this, but equality assumes the persons have the same starting point. And we don't. <laughs> we start from different places. We have different bodies of resource and history and access. And so being equitable is the way in which we level that playing field so that People who do not have the same starting position have an opportunity to come into parity with the other. And that's true on both sides, those who may have something we would consider a deficit and those who have privilege, who oft often think, well, I shouldn't have to give up anything. Is it really giving up anything? What we want is to give people an opportunity to see each other peer to peer. So think Think equity as we move through this today. And of course, to be generative, uh, those of you that were conference, you know this, but for those that weren't, I want to just give you a quick definition here. Generative comes from generate. This isn't fancy. I just looked it up in the dictionary, folks. It means to originate new thinking. It means to translate those ideas, the things our imagination can conjure into something tangible, practical, objective, I can touch it and feel it, and learn. How do I implement this thing I've created and see how it works, the spirit of experimentation and bringing in the left brain to analyze and 
holding on to the right brain about why does it stimulate us? And then ultimately making the decision to choose something that we will offer to another, to produce a result, some influence, some impact in the world that we see as viable and enlivening and contributory. So when that happens from an internal stance, something that feels essential to our nature, that is an expression that is uniquely ours. So generative and authentic, this is the moment at which we're living in a sovereign way, accepting responsibility for creating the relationship to our life circumstances that's most satisfying and fulfilling. Now, I've just been finishing talking about my worldview and mindset, if you hadn't noticed. <laughs> so I want to give you a moment. When you hear the word mindset, what is it that you think is relevant about mindset to leading and to coaching. So use the chat pod or, you know, if you just want to shout it out, that's okay with me too. What about mindset and its relevance to leading and coaching? Okay, Galleon, that's right. Growth mindset is one type of a mindset. What others are they? Open-minded, present, how is presence and openness and open-mindedness and being growth-oriented relevant to leading and coaching? Janet, this is Joyce. I was Hi. just working with a group of managers and we were talking about um, their mindset as it relates to authority and the authority they have in their position of management versus when they're trying to exercise leadership and the mindset being so different as far as having a mindset of telling, you know, giving people answers, directing, et cetera, versus being curious, you know, allowing other people to explore and experiment with ideas, et cetera. Beautiful, beautiful. And that is a profound mindset shift because we have decades of learning and development that's been focusing on people using their acumen their expertise, their knowledge, their interests in um, a highly refined, repeatable, consistent way. So when they're faced with the unknown or some challenge that is outside the boundary of what they call their acumen and knowledge and intelligence and interests, they don't know what to do. <laughs> we haven't done a good job of helping people learn how to adapt to what's emergent and unknown. And I'm going to add another little piece, Joyce, since you brought this in. Here's a definition of accountability I would invite you to play around with, which is accept response. Oops, helps if you can spell well. Accept responsibility for authority granted. Now, you can think about this in yourself. You have the authority to make really good choices about how you are going to take care of your health. Just as an example, what do you do for your own vitality? It's all your choice about whether you eat healthy, rest well, do exercise, whatever it might be. You alone have the authority to make that decision and the responsibility to follow through on it. However, in an organization, we often can feel like somebody is imposing something on us. I don't have choice about accepting responsibility. It's just what's expected. And yet in that moment, don't I have a responsibility to say, if that's what's expected, what resource do I have? By when do you want it? What does success look like? How are we mutually satisfied? If I promise to deliver on this thing that I'm responsible for, what is it that in turn as the requester um, will be my reward. We don't do that. We take it blindly as if it is the only answer. And in some ways, this is that mindset of I'll follow rather than peer-to-peer -peer partner to identify what serves both the requester and the promiser. And in a lot of ways, this is, this is a huge transformation that's happening as a result of having gone to hybrid workplace. We don't have the convenience of looking over someone's shoulder and saying, oh, wait, that isn't really what I meant. <laughs> and so leaders have had to learn to let go, um, trust that they've given them enough authority and given them enough access to resource so that they can perform. 
and uh, hasn't always worked out well. So I'm not surprised, Joyce, to hear uh, what's happening there. Let me see, what else? Sensory acuity. Ah, uh, well, you know, the slides are just gonna give you the answer. So I'll put it there for you. <laughs> sensory acuity, Reynaldo. What's an example of sensory acuity when it comes to mindset? Well, be aware of the, uh, not only what, what the person is telling you, but be aware of the body language, be aware of any, any sign that you are, uh, probably you have to change the conversation because something is going on, being present, being there, 100%. Yes, yes. okay. So frame of mind, um, and uh, uh, Sui had brought presence forward as well. So that's on both sides. What's the mindset of my client that I'm experiencing right now? What, how am I experiencing their emotional attitude what thoughts are coming out of their mind? How congruent are they with that frame of mind and attitude? Oh, that language signals some belief. Is it a limiting belief or an empowering belief? And is it mine to infer or to interpret? And the answer, of course, is no, by the way. Um, where am I seeing a habit of language or a habit of behavior? And these are all things that influence how we show up, make decisions and interaction and interact with others. When we can become better observers of ourselves as coaches, we become, um, what's the word I'm looking for? We can interchange the lenses on our camera. We can go from micro to macro and back to micro again. And the key is to not do it in our heads alone, but to do it out loud. Listens Actively talks about being able to integrate beyond the words to the tone and the energy shifts that we experience. And we do that with curiosity. We don't name what we see. We notice. I notice a shift in, the, in your posture. I notice a shift in the pacing of how you just delivered that statement in answer to the question, what's emerging for you? And of course, the reason we want to do that is because all of us, our neurobiology is wired toward habit. This part of our brain, the back of our neck, the oldest part of the human body is the reticular activating system, and it prefers habit. It's an energy conserver. Of course, it's the same wiring for our source of change, <laughs> which is why change becomes so difficult for us. Our body doesn't like it, and we can help it like it by adopting. You could call it a growth mindset. I like to think about it more as an open mindset that is allowing for our habit to be consciously aware and then to be deliberate to say, and what else is here for me? What else might I be experiencing that I haven't noticed and allowed myself to be curious about? So mindset is super important. And this is not a talk about mindset shift, but I do happen to believe it's one of our most underdeveloped capacities. Now, it has a lot to do with why we other. Othering removes what disturbs us. When we're uncomfortable with somebody, we've learned to be uncomfortable. It doesn't mean that in the moment we're in any way at risk. We might be, but most of the time it's not true. Most of the time our discomfort is coming out of our history. And if we don't pause and say, is this true? What's the evidence of this? What question might I ask to get to the bottom of it? And of course, if we don't ask the question, we are denying our humanity, each person's right to be exactly who they are in that moment, in any moment. And here's the rub. Belonging requires consciousness. It is connections in our DNA. We cannot deny it as this species called humans on this planet Earth, in this universe, we are wired to be socially together. So when we're othering and separating ourselves, we're going against our very nature. Well, no wonder we end up in incivility and separation. This is the impulse that's necessary for us to uh, rise to the challenge of and allow ourselves to choose belonging on purpose in a deliberate way. Uh, some of you might know uh, Dumasani uh, Magalita. He is uh, on the ICFGE board. He was um, before that also on the foundation board. He's just an extraordinary coach. And 
over the years, we've had a lot of conversation about Ubuntu, which is a, a Swahili word. And this is the shorthand phrase, I am because you are. But as he and I have talked, he said, you know, the real meaning of Ubuntu is I cannot be fully me unless you can be fully you. Well, how in the world do I know unless I ask? And my act of asking is how someone begins the, the, the steps toward belonging. This is another way of talking about competency for if you're looking at those skills. How do we cultivate trust and safety? by being with and being with in a genuine way that invites someone to reveal who they are to us. And in their revelation, we acknowledge and celebrate and stay curious to say, how is my presence with you supporting you to come fully alive here? What's important for me to understand and appreciate about who you are as a human being, who you've become in your life and what you're yearning for? that will help us to know what path we might go down in our coaching together. So often coaches get trapped into thinking we have to figure it out. Well, that's when you stop coaching. <laughs> and ultimately the client recognizes when we step into that leading. Nobody does it on purpose. I know that you've all been well-trained as coaches, but we can get seduced into really interesting content and all of a sudden lose our way. So. The key here is to remember this principle that I can't be fully me unless you can be fully you, which puts precedence on being client-centered and always being in a learning space. What do I not yet know about this client in front of me? Got it. Go ahead. Um, it feels like a mouthful you just gave. I can't be fully me until unless you can be fully you. Uh -huh. And I'm wondering if you can help make that a little more tangible because I'm not fully, uh, probably not fully understanding it. And it sounds like a, yeah, I'm not fully getting it. <laughs> okay. So how about an example? That'd be great. I was working with, uh, I was working with a young Oh, 28, 29 year old executive in Sri Lanka who is working in uh, what's called a fintech firm. So in intensely competitive, fast paced, they do everything in agile sprints, which is a uh, three weeks from beginning to end. And I'm a strategic thinker. <laughs> um, as we were talking in a chemistry session and she said, I'm choosing you to be my coach because you're not anything like me. <laughs> She's very direct. And I said, so how do you imagine this is going to work? And she said, I want to understand people who don't think like me because without that, I'm not going to be effective at being in relationship with them. I won't be a good leader with them. I won't be able to hear what their needs are when I'm designing a new system. I just won't have the capacity to incorporate it. And I'd want to, because I realize if I can see it in you, it must be in me, but I'm not there yet. Pretty wise young woman she was. So I said, okay, I, I, I will agree to be your coach as long as I have full permission to keep asking you questions about how you see the world, because I clearly understand you see the world very differently than I do. And she agreed. So I'm giving you a really practical way that for me to be fully available to her in my capacity as coach was such difference in our worldviews, our history, our geography, our culture, our family lineage, our sociology, our philosophies, our anthropology, and my own mindset about leadership and how it operates, we were going to have to build a lot of bridges together. So for me to be good, she needed to be fully her. I needed to get all of it, even if it was a little hard for me to swallow. For her to be fully herself, she needed to give me permission to be fully me. So this is what this is talking about. It's a reciprocal relationship of full transparency. It's not necessary to meet in full alignment. 
it's necessary to meet in full respect. Yes. Who are you and who are you becoming? How do I be with that in the most acknowledging and honoring way? We must learn about that from each other. Otherwise, we manage, we short circuit, we close off certain parts of ourselves, we shape shift. Um, some of you might have had clients that had 360 feedback that said, you know, this person is uh, unpredictable. They're this way in this meeting and this way in that meeting. And I never know who's going to show up in the office. And they all gossip to say, good mood, bad mood. Can you bring a new idea? No, not today. Come back later. Like executive assistants made a lot of friends in organizations being gatekeepers to say, oh, yeah, you should go in now. <laughs> he or she is in a good mood. We don't want that. that. What a waste of energy. Talk about underperform to potential. <laughs> so. How does the example do for you? Uh, it definitely helps move me along. I heard permission in there. And I'm curious, what's challenging for you to show up fully as you? Um, not much anymore. Gets, that, <laughs> I said not much anymore. <laughs> or, or let's, all right, let's relate it out to people. Generally, what gets in the way? So we can question. avoid some of these things, these traps of, of preventing us from showing up fully. Is there one that pops to mind for you? Uh, here, well, as a coach, where I may not understand someone's world, or even as a human, where I may not understand someone's world, is a uh, loss of credibility. Right. If I don't understand, I won't be credible. That's a good one. What about expectations? What's expected of me? And I take that without questioning. Because if I don't deliver on what's expected, I won't get asked back. So it's economics insecurity. Anybody got another one? Comparison. Comparison. Oh my goodness. That's a good one. What about they won't like me? Yeah, coaches struggle with that a lot. I want to be liked. I want to be nice so that they'll be nice back to me. There are all kinds of ways where the emotional selves in us, because we do flock to this profession out of our great desire to care and to have influence and in creating positivity and possibility, we often compromise on what we believe. But here's the irony. It's competency 7.2, 7.2 .2 or 3, <laughs> challenge to evoke insight. I'm not going to challenge if I'm caught up managing how somebody perceives me. If I care, this is fear of other people's opinions, FOPO. <laughs> if I care what other people think about me, they're not going to get the best of me. And that's not what they're paying me for. Clients are paying us to help them see what they cannot see on their own. That in the absence of the creative and thought provoking process that we call the coaching conversation, they want to see something emergent. They want to drop into what's not known to them so they can grow and have a bigger impact in their lives, however they define that. But that means this is why cultivating trust and safety is so important. It has to be okay to not know and to be comfortable with being uncomfortable. And that starts with us. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Great questions. So here's what I'd like you to do. Jimmy, do you want to set up breakout rooms for triads for me? Sure. Thank you. You tell them what you want to do and I'll get them started. <laughs> That's great. All right. So for 10 minutes, just have a conversation with each other. Um, we've had a, a delicious opportunity here to examine, oh, Ubuntu, that seemed a little strange. That would be an example of something that challenged his worldview and his mindset. There may be some other things. So you might be with somebody who's read the article. Otherwise, what's challenged your worldview and mindset and what I've said already? And what surprised you about the answers that you give in the conversation? So stay in the moment, in your 10 minutes, chat. Maybe reserve the last minute when we close the room. You'll still have 60 seconds. Huh. That surprised me that I was thinking that. And then when we come back, we'll take a few popcorn responses. So 10 minutes mm -hmm. and these questions. And um, if you, I'm not, oh, there we are. I can see them now. 
and I will put those questions into the broadcasts once, they, once say, you open the room. And we'll take care of that as well. <laughs> Let me just make sure I've got enough people in each room. All right. Very yes. cool. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> wow. I am having a fit. I do not like leaving my breakout. <laughs> <laughs> That never happens to any of us. Okay. Sorry, Mr. Sorry, guys, I clicked the wrong button. <laughs> uh. <laughs> All right, I'm going to read this poem and then ask you to popcorn what came out of your um, out of your breakout rooms. The range of what we think and do is limited by what we fail to notice, and because we fail to notice that we fail to notice there is little we can do to change until we notice how failing to notice shapes our thoughts and deeds. And um, the image, if you're wondering, is courtesy of my husband who loves doing photography. I just love the way this duck is able to turn its head backwards and sideways. <laughs> that's, my, that's my reminder that there's more than one right answer and more than one way to look at a situation or a person. So what did you notice that surprised you out of your conversation with your colleagues? Let's just do a little uh, popcorn here. He's a yogi. <laughs> That's cool. For sure. What surprised you? Um, what surprised me, I, I shared it in my breakout group, and what surprised me is that um, how we're addicted to rejection. I look at it as an addiction. We, <laughs> we're addicted to it. <laughs> Pretty smart you are, Miss Misha Gay. It's true. The question is, what is served? What's supported? What's um, contributory to being addicted? Mm. Your own limitations. Yeah, that's right. My emotional security is kept intact. However, everybody hits a moment in our lives when we say some variation on this theme. I am bored out of my mind. <laughs> I want something different and I can't remember what it is because I have been in this pattern, this habit, this addiction for a really long time. I had a CEO that hired me to do a six month exit from the firm strategy with him. <laughs> and we were about two months into the engagement and he finally one day woke up and looked at me across the table and he said, I'm not done in this job yet. <laughs> I said, no kidding. And he laughed <laughs> and I said, so now you've noticed what you've been failing to notice for a while. Now we can actually do the real work you want to do. <laughs> and you know, this happens. We we get comfortable with our status quo. And then it feels too risky to break out of our box. What we'd love to do is have the younger generation never create a box in the first place and learn to be adaptive with what's emergent. And I do think that's a leading edge of where we're going in coaching. It will alter the way we train coaches. It will alter the way coaches engage and contract. It will alter what clients are expecting and asking for. Mm. Thank you, Misha. What else? What else surprised you? Nothing? See, notice they have their mute on. So we're always going to have this count to three before somebody answers. <laughs> All right, cats got their cone. I will move on then. You can hold it within your group. So you might look at your handout. I'm going to highlight a few things about the core competencies and the ones that are on that sheet in particular. So first, let's look at the verbs. And what I'm addressing here is 
uh, Mark's question. How do I how do I help somebody be fully them with me? And you could think about this as instructions. Um, you as coach are expected to be sensitive to, remain aware and open to, seeks to, demonstrates respect for, and considers to enhance. Those are the how, and this is the what. Identity, mm -hmm. environment. Experiences, perceptions, language, culture, style, values, beliefs, context. So think for a moment about the last time you onboarded a new client. I call it an initial discovery session. We finished the contracting and we're coming together to really deepen our relationship, get to know each other well, find out what they're likely to be focusing on for our six, nine, 12 months together, whatever it is. And I always intend to leave that session with the first pass on a coach uh, coaching plan. What What's the development for this individual and how will they know that that's contributing in a positive way, measures of success and kinds of activities might we be engaging in? Because I will have learned a lot about how they describe their identity what's actually operating in their environment? What are the experiences in their life that have shaped who they are? How do they see the world? How do they make meaning of the world? What's the language that they're using? And I don't mean English or Spanish or Portuguese. I do mean the language of feelings, of cognition, of sensation, of spirit, of soul? Do they even use that word? What are the ways in which they describe their world? Those are going to give me clues about culture, but I'll never know without asking them. Learning style, um, ways of making understanding for themselves. Uh, one of my colleagues, Dr. Lawrence Hillman, talks a lot about yin and yang, right and left brain is a likely synonym, the um, qualities of the feminine, the qualities of the masculine, which live in both sexes, all sexes, gender fluidity. We can't speak about the sexes. That's not respectful. So how do we draw out the traits from those individuals? How do they acknowledge their identity? And what are the beliefs that come from the life experience and all the things on the list? And then ultimately, into what context are we doing the coaching? Now, this one's a little tricky because of course, we're coaching the whole person. So they may have a presenting context, but you always have permission to work in all of the contexts of their lives. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes I've found that the main context that they engage through, let's say their business, um, it's a little too close. So we might talk about something in their family with a sibling or with a spouse or with their children or maybe somebody in the next ring of their family life where they have a little more access to describe the uh, cause and effect, the stimulus to behave a certain way and seeing the consequence. Once they've gotten it out and they can see, oh, that's how I, that's my rhythm. That's how I'm operating. Then I can ask the question. What's familiar about that when you think about your direct report team? And it takes us right back into the context. So you get to work with the whole life for sure. All right, let me pause right. there before we go into pairs. Um, as you're looking at the sheet in front of you, you'll notice that the verbs are in, there's one skill in competency one, there's one skill in competency two, there's two in competency four and one in competency six. Imagine if we weren't asking, what would be the breadth and depth? What would be the impact on breadth and depth of your client partnership? If we weren't asking these questions. This is exactly the reason why these were brought into the core competencies. It is one of the ways in which the ICF is recognizing if we're to be equitable, coaches must accept responsibility for 
learning about the whole person. And that's what these skills are for. Mm -hmm. And I have noticed the PCC markers when they were updated are very particular about this. So we're making some progress in terms of recognizing what does it mean to be client-centered? That's not from our point of view. Client-centered is defined by the client. And there's no way you can be successful if you're not getting a robust exploration of this. So here's what we're going to do. I wanna give you an opportunity to have a chemistry session. How many of you do chemistry sessions or free sessions before you start with somebody? Yeah, everybody, okay, good. All right, and here we go. So they'll be, they'll be in pairs, pairs to me. To me. Okay. And your partner is someone you consider a potential client. Be authentic and real here. Be who you are. They're hiring who you are. And God forbid you be one way in a chemistry session and a whole other way by the time you show up to do the coaching itself. Doesn't make any sense. Just be yourselves. That's why I call it real play. Experiment with these five skills, broadening the source of your curiosity to experience what your sense of fit is. It doesn't matter whether the person as you're talking to them is somebody you want to have as your client or not. The learning here is about broadening your vocabulary and the scope of what you're asking about and then stay available for what the client, the person you're working with, um, says back to you and how it fits into your own rubric of who you think this person could be in your portfolio of clients. Jenna, could you go back to the previous slide for me, please? With those? Sure. Thank you. Absolutely. Right there. <coughs> Thank you. And these are also on your handout. Um, and let's make a note next to the one skill in one, one skill in two, two skills in four, and one skill in six. Thank you. You bet. And they go with uh, is sensitive to, remains aware, and open to, seeks to, demonstrates respect for, and considers to enhance. All right. Any other questions? <laughs> what is important about all of this is to remember as in old coaching there is no right or wrong it just isn't this is about building a muscle having the courage to be more curious about who another is than you are in sharing who you are that will come clients must know it's okay and i just heard a beautiful story of two people who had known each other for two years and the individual came in and sat down for the first coaching session and said, I am transgender. And that receptivity on the part of the coach made it possible for them to have trust and safety in that moment. And of course, I want you to feel just how liberating it is for people to be able to tell the truth about who they are, no matter who they are, no matter how they identify, no matter what their life experience, it's magnificent and worthy of our respect. And this is the opportunity we have. If we want to heal divisions in the world. It's really important that we build our own practices for acceptance. And as we model that, clients find acceptance in themselves. It might not always happen in the first time we have a conversation. If we're steady with it, we keep extending the invitation, being sensitive to, giving consideration for, being curious unconditionally. I'm asking questions I cannot possibly know the answer to. Only the client can. We'll transform the world into a place that is more loving, more accepting, more inclusive. Mm. So these two questions here are inquiries for you things to be journaling on, things to be chatting with each other about. Let what we've done tonight just linger with you a bit and start to notice in your everyday conversation, are you consciously choosing to generate belonging? And 
just a couple of other free offers for you. That's a code, Invite Change, all capitals. If you're not subscribed to Choice, you can use that code and get a 25% discount. Again, that's choice-online.com. And there's a fun little TEDx talk about why judgment is the key to invite change. And of course the book. And I think um, um, Jimmy's going to get a whole bunch. <laughs> Jimmy and Misha yeah. are going to get a whole bunch. I did get noticed that there's on their way to me. I'll be signing them and sending them your way. I'll let you know when you can expect them. Thank you. And the rest of the slides in the deck are the range of programs. We've been an accredited provider for the ICF since the very beginning. We were one of the first three to be accredited and have continuously offered trainings, including advanced development. And there's my contact information. I am absolutely available. Um, I do answer my own phone. Misha and Jimmy will attest to that. <laughs> and I love hearing from you. So connect with me on LinkedIn, ask questions. Uh, if you want some follow-up time, I'm also happy to offer that. Thank you, Janet. And thanks for the discount for um, the Choice Magazine. I am a subscriber and I encourage all of you rich information in there, just really good content. And I encourage all of you to subscribe as well. It's awesome. <laughs> Thank you, Diamond. There is um, some question in the chat, Janet. Uh -huh. mind. Um, so Farella, she's asking, Janet, I wonder um, if in the other hand, have you ever had to draw a line? Mm. Uh, meaning um, I'm in that discovery process and in it's that clear that process. we wouldn't, we're, we're not um, compatible. Yes, actually, that's happened a lot. Um, I am remembering a, a young woman that I, I, I swear she had six chemistry sessions with me and I left each one of them saying, now is not the time for coaching. And uh, she was in therapy. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I do sometimes take clients who are in both therapy and working with mm -hmm. me as a coach, but I'm very particular about <laughs> boundaries and relationship and open transparency. I don't want any triangulation. I want the client to be conscious about which things they're bringing where, and I want full permission to say, that's not a coaching topic. You need to take that to your therapist. And uh, this gal was adamant. And the sixth time I finally said, because she convinced me, she had given me enough of her experience and backgrounds and particular experience with therapeutic process and the things that she was working. And she said, therapy cannot do what I want, which is to support me to go back into my life and normalize it. I will always live with the condition that I have and I will always have a therapist, but I must function <laughs> and my therapist won't help me function. I was like, wow. <laughs> so mm -hmm. I give you that example to say, I drew the line five times. <laughs> and the sixth time I said, now it's clear to me because she'd given me enough background on who she was that I could see she had the capacity to transcend the pieces of her life that were not caught in the piece that was necessary to be clinically addressed. And she could meet me as a peer adult, adult to adult. And uh, we worked together for two years. That was quite wonderful. Varela, did you have a follow-up question to that? Thank you. Uh, yes, yes. Thank you. Thanks for the. I mean, that's a case that I have a lot. I mean, but uh, but I was what I meant really, Janet, was like someone that you draw the line because it's in the line of not belonging. It's like, oh my God, what do I have in front of me? The reincarnation of, and you're like, oh, where am I? <laughs> <laughs> so how do you handle that? Um, just like you did, although maybe without this. <laughs> I think it's really important that we be transparent with our when our value system is compromised. There are times when I have worked with people that we have a, a disagreement in our value system, but not about acceptance of human wholeness. So if I have someone who is adamant that they have a point of view that some people don't have the right to exist, that's a hard line for me. 
Yeah. And it's important to tell the truth about that. So the, the client understands, look, you're going to come across people like me in other times in your life. So please um, think about the impact and the influence you're having, because you called me wanting to have relationship in your life. You might consider this conversation your first noticing of what may be the reason you're not having relationship in your life. I'm pretty cheeky. <laughs> yeah, you are. <laughs> hey, I don't have a breath to waste. Life is way too precious. Yeah. And way too short. And way too short. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Janet. Anyone else? Did that answer your question, Farella? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Good question. Well, Misha Gay, do you have anything else you'd like to share with us before we uh, call it a night? No, just as another special thank you to Janet. Thank you so much for just making us a part of your schedule today and making us a part of your heart. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Absolutely. And Pleasure. My Thank pleasure, you, Janet. Hey, we'll see you in a couple of weeks for the next. No, I'm just kidding. He's <laughs> <laughs> <Just> horrible, Janet. <laughs> he got you. Uh, for a you That's not fair, Jimmy. I already got so excited. <laughs> it, it, enjoy we'll, the rest of 22. Yeah, we'll book Janet for 23. Yeah. 23 is going to be a big year. So, big, big year. I'm excited. Yeah. All right, All everybody. Right, everybody. Thank you. Take so much. Care. Thank you, Janet, for mm -hmm. another amazing session. You are the best. And um, we really have, um, we're very uh, grateful for your gracious, uh, generous nature. So thank you so much. Everybody, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, click the link, fill out the form, let us know what you think. And um, we will continue to deliver amazing content here at ICF South Florida. Thank you, Janet. Thank you, Misha. Thank, thank you. you, everyone. Well, thank Good you, Jimmy. Bye. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Janet. Bye. Bye. Bye.